a virtual information and resource town hall for anyone impacted by the recent floods from Tropical Storm Ida, or recent damage period, flood, flooding or otherwise. Please, um, uh, again, 10 o'clock Friday morning, joining Pat and me for this town hall will be representatives from FEMA, along with several members of the cabinet, including the Department of Environmental Protection Commissioner Sean LaTourette, Banking and Insurance Commissioner Marlene Caride, and Human Services Acting Commissioner Sarah Edelman. We'll also be joined by Dan Kelly, who heads the Governor's Disaster Recovery Office. We'll be taking questions and helping those who aren't sure of where to turn to navigate the programs available to them during what is certainly a challenging time, to put it lightly or mildly, for them and our state. To register, enter in that bit.ly URL that you see there at the bottom of the screen, bit.ly slash recovery town hall. Once you register, you'll get the Zoom login information emailed to you. And before we move on, we are anticipating some potentially severe weather tomorrow into Friday. A flash flood watch has already been posted for Hunterdon, Mercer, Middlesex, Morris, Somerset, Sussex, and Warren counties. So everybody, please be safe and please pay attention to further weather alerts. Pat, I think you're going to have some more on that um, when we hear from you. Now, moving on, I want to give a quick breakdown of the most recent reports on school-related COVID outbreaks that are being tracked by the Department of Health. Currently, there are a total of 23 outbreaks that have been identified. Among students, there are 82 reported cases of COVID across 22 school districts, with 16 cases among staff in 10 of those districts. And there is one district where an outbreak has been identified solely among four staff members. I'll ask Judy to give a little bit more color on these outbreaks in her report, and I know that Angelica will have more to add as well. As the new academic year unfolds, we are continuing to work with our educational communities and local health partners to ensure that our schools remain safe spaces for learning. We have previously discussed the screening testing program that we're engaged in with the majority of our school districts. We are updating the existing schools tab on our COVID dashboard with this new data. As the K through 12 screening testing program we have previously discussed gets more fully underway, we do anticipate having more robust data to share. Okay, let's move on. First up, the latest vaccination numbers as of this morning. You can see the numbers there. And here are the updated numbers of positive PCR and presumed positive antigen tests. Looking to our healthcare networks, here is the on the ground reality lived by the doctors and nurses and associated medical staffs at our 71 hospitals yesterday. We continue to see a leveling of the numbers across each category, which is a bit of a double edged sword. It is good to not see these numbers increasing as they had been a few weeks ago, but it is not so good to not yet see a meaningful decrease. And here is the newly confirmed COVID-related deaths and bless these souls, losses of life. Eight, Judy, I've got eight are from this week, while 16 occurred in prior weeks of that 24 confirmed losses of life. Now let's take a couple of minutes, as we always do, to honor the lives of several more of those who have been lost to this pandemic. First up, let's remember this woman, Marietta Jean Jazikoff, who passed away on January 2nd at the age of 84. She was a longtime resident of the Waretown section of Ocean Township in Ocean County. Marietta was a CPA, having earned her degree at Georgian Court University, to which she remained an active and giving alumna. With her skills, she served as an auditor for the state of New Jersey, and she was an outstanding one. Away from work, Marietta had a deep love of travel and her passport was stamped in more than 50 countries over the years, including a trip to Antarctica. But back home in Waretown, she enjoyed a slower pace, feeding the shorebirds that would visit her. Marietta is survived by a longtime friend, 
Wolfgang, with whom I had the great honor of speaking on Monday. He was born in Germany, so some of our conversation was in German. And she is also survived by her family and state government. We thank her for her service, and we know she's on another journey. And may God bless and watch over her. Next up, we recall a native and lifelong resident of Lakewood, John Franklin. He was 91 years old when we lost him to COVID on January 12th. John was a mason by trade, having gotten his start at the age of 12. And right out of high school, he started his own contracting business. But the Korean conflict soon intervened, and John closed his business to enlist in the United States Marine Corps. He served a year on the battlefields as a member of Baker Company in the 1st Engineer Battalion, and then one more year back home at Camp Lejeune with the 8th Engineer Battalion. He returned to Lakewood in 1954 and became a partner in a new masonry business and continued in the construction industry before joining the Lakewood Public Works Department in 1972. He retired from the township in 2010 at the age of 80. John was an active and respected member of the community, serving two years on the school board and another 28 as a member of the township committee, including five years as Lakewood's mayor. Even after his retirement, he spent another 10 years as a member of the Lakewood Planning Board. When Lakewood built its new public works building, it was named in John's honor. John was also a founder of Lakewood's Pop Warner Football League and a member of both the American Legion and VFW, the Elks, and fittingly, perhaps the Masonic Lodge, among many other community organizations. Just three months after John's passing, his beloved wife, Lorraine, also passed, not from COVID. They were married for 67 years. They had four children, Kathy, Jay, and Jim, who survived them, and I had a, a great honor of speaking with Jim on Monday, and a third son, Doug, who preceded, predeceased them uh, and was killed in a car accident. Uh, John was also predeceased by a granddaughter, Jalen, bless her, but his seven other grandchildren, Brian, Kyle, Andrew, Stephanie, Taylor, Jimmy, and Victoria, and seven great-grandchildren all survive him to carry on his tremendous legacy of service. We thank John for all that he did across his years for our nation and the township and people of Lakewood. May God bless and watch over him. His son, Jim, wanted me to say the following, and I quote his son, Jim. Pretty powerful. People who refuse to get vaccinated have never seen a family member die on FaceTime. It's awful. Again, that's John's son, Jim. I quote him again. People who refuse to get vaccinated have never seen a family member die on FaceTime. It's awful. God bless you, John. And finally, for this Wednesday, let's honor Asbury Parks' Elvira Lutz Vera, as she was known by many, was 85 years old when she passed on January 9th. As a youth, Vera was a model and locally was a recognizable presence every year at Asbury Park's Easter Day Parade on its iconic boardwalk. She wearing one of those great Easter bonnets. But professionally, she served in the secretari secretarial pool at Fort Monmouth for many years. Throughout her life, Vera always maintained a keen sense of humor and always showed kindness to those around her. She's survived by her two sons, Mark and Kenneth, and I had the great honor of speaking with Mark on Monday, and her daughter, Allison, along with Mark's wife, Lee, six grandchildren, Joseph Shannon, Shannon, uh, sorry, Joseph Shannon, Shannon, Kenneth Jr., Cassidy, and Olivia, and great-grandson, Carter. She also left behind her brother and sister-in-law, Carmen and Christine, along with her nieces and nephews and dear friends, May God bless Vera and watch over her memory and her family. And we honor and remember everyone who has been lost over the past 18 months, and our thoughts are with all those who they have left behind. Now let's switch gears as we do to recognize another of the terrific small businesses and the people behind them helping us move our state forward. Today we're in historic Princeton, not too far from where we are as we speak, where you can find the home furnishing store Homestead Princeton on Witherspoon Street in a repurposed building that once housed the Princeton Packet newspaper. Homestead is owned and operated by the husband and wife duo right there on the screen, Kristen and Ron Menapace. 
I think you know this store, Judy, right? Uh, Ron and Kristen are no strangers to challenges. They opened Homestead just two days before Superstorm Sandy upended our state. Unbowed, they charged on, establishing Homestead as a leading source for home furnishings, including their own line of sustainable custom furniture built from reclaimed, reclaimed vintage barnwood. And in good part because of this, Homestead Princeton is the only furniture store recognized by the New Jersey Sustainable Business Initiative. When the pandemic put their nine years of effort to the test, Ron and Kristen partnered with the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, securing the grant funding they needed to expand their warehouse and staging area into a recently purchased schoolhouse and to maintain their operations and also support the jobs they've created. And if you've ever been at Drumthwacket, you may have noticed the handmade sign noting the history of the original Olden House on the estate, a sign that Ron made. I thanked Ron and Kristen when I spoke with them on Monday for all they are doing to support not just Princeton's economy, but for their leadership in our growing sustainable economy as well. Check them out, homesteadprinceton.com, homesteadprinceton.com. It is well worth it. And finally for today, let's end on a positive note. I must give a huge shout out to this guy, Jersey City Police Officer Eduardo Matute. Last Saturday, Officer Matute was among the members of the Jersey City Police responding to a call that led to a standoff with a resident. That resident dangled a one-month-old infant over the second-story balcony of an apartment and then dropped the baby. Springing into action, Officer Matute caught the child, who was unharmed and checked out at Jersey City Medical Center as a precaution. The man who dropped the baby, by the way, was immediately arrested on multiple charges. So thank you to all the officers to res who responded, but a special kudos is due to Officer Matude for his quick and sure hands that saved the life of that precious little child. And that's a good place to end today. Again, as a reminder that on Friday, we will be holding a town hall specifically on our recovery efforts from the recent floods and I encourage everyone who has been impacted to join. Again, there's the information on screen, and we'll have links to register on all of our social media platforms. When in doubt, simply go to nj.gov slash Ida. nj.gov slash Ida. With that, Angelica, are you ready to go? Yes. Please help me welcome the Acting Commissioner of the Department of Education, Dr. Angelica Allen McMillan. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is an honor, as always, to join you, Governor Murphy. The progress I am sharing today on the start of the 2021-2022 school year would not have been possible without the collaboration of our agencies. Thank you for your continued partnership, Commissioner Persichelli and Colonel Callahan. This fall marks our state's return to full-time in-person learning. I want to acknowledge the difficulty of the transition for some. However, students and educators continue to demonstrate tremendous resolve in developing new tools and skills to adapt school environments that the public health emergency continues to demand of us. To all New Jersey students and all my fellow educators, I wish you an enriching school year. While our school systems rode forward out of the pandemic, prioritized the return to full-time in-person learning for all school districts and charter and renaissance schools, we must recognize that COVID-19 continues to impact how students learn and educators teach. For example, students, staff, and visitors are required to wear a mask regardless of vaccination status in the indoor premises of school buildings, with limited exceptions. With the support of the New Jersey Office of Emergency Management, we were able to offer 6 million KN95 and surgical masks to support this necessity. Additionally, by October 18th, all local educational agencies, non-public schools, and parochial schools must maintain a policy that requires all covered workers to either provide proof of full vaccination or submit to COVID-19 testing 
at minimum of one to two times weekly. In instances where individual students, groups of students, or entire classes are excluded from school as a result of meeting COVID-19 exclusion criteria, local educational agencies are strongly encouraged to immediately provide virtual or remote instruction to those students commensurate with in-person instruction. As announced in June, the administration released and continues to update health and safety guidance detailing recommendations designed to provide a healthy and safe environment for students and staff during the 2021-2022 school year. The department has taken several steps to support school communities as well. Next week, local educational agencies can begin applying for the first installment of their American Rescue Plan Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Funds, also known as ARP ESSER funds. New Jersey received a total of over $2.76 billion of these funds. The grants supplement the funds made available previously and provide targeted support for learning acceleration, summer enrichment, learning supports taking place outside traditional school hours, and mental health supports. We continue to work closely with Commissioner Persa Kelly and the Department of Health to support their K through 12 screening testing program. This is a $267 million program designed to assist participating local educational agencies and non-public schools with screening testing plans. We released the Learning Acceleration Guide, which provides specific research-based principles and strategies to accelerate learning. This guide aims to help anchor districts' academic, social, and emotional interventions to the common purpose of promoting global competitiveness for all students. As students return to in-person learning after many challenging months, it is critical to address the mental health and well-being of students and staff. To help support our school communities, the department published a reopening self-assessment that provides guidance and resources for building safe and inclusive learning environments, supporting the social, emotional, and mental health needs of students and educators and developing specific strategies to address the unique needs of vulnerable student populations. The department has earmarked $48 million of New Jersey State set aside of ARP ESSER funds to the New Jersey tiered system of supports mental health support staffing grant that will aid in the development of programs to support the mental health of students and staff. Districts are strongly encouraged to use their additional federal funds to supplement these efforts. And crucially, in the event of an emergency, school districts must be prepared to transition to school or district-wide virtual or remote instruction. To that end, the department released guidance for local educational agencies to develop emergency virtual or remote instruction plans as required by legislation signed by the governor in April of last year. The importance of this emergency provision for virtual or remote instruction is evident. As today, flood damage from Hurricane Ida is preventing 13 schools in eight districts from serving students in person. The virtual and remote learning techniques districts have refined in the last 18 months, and the planning this administration has put in place have enabled these schools to temporarily shift instruction, ensuring continuity of educational services for students. We also understand that districts must continue working with their local health departments to make operational decisions based on local COVID-19 transmission data. The department receives regular notifications of schools implementing virtual or remote instruction due to local COVID-19 incidences. 
As of today, the department is aware of a total of seven schools that have implemented school-wide virtual or remote instruction due to COVID-19 since the start of the school year. Three of those schools currently remain all virtual or remote. The 2021-2022 school year in New Jersey is off to a strong start. We stand ready to continue providing supports needed to make this a safe, successful, and fulfilling school year. Thank you, Governor. Angelica, thank you. Great summary. Um, again, this is not going to be a straight line. We never promised that it would be, but considering the broader picture, um, as you suggested, up and down the state, off to a strong start. Thanks for your leadership to you and your team. Uh, please help me welcome the woman on my right who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. Uh, thank you, Governor, and good afternoon. We continue to encourage all those eligible for COVID-19 vaccines to get vaccinated, not only to reduce the risk for severe disease for themselves, but also others with whom they may come in contact with. Currently, 59% of individuals 12 to 17 years of age have received at least one dose of vaccine. The percentage is higher among those 16 and 17 years of age at 68%. Among those 12 to 15 of age, 55% have uh, received at least one dose of the vaccine. We'd like to see that number higher, uh, particularly for this age group, especially because they come in contact with children who are currently too young, not eligible to be vaccinated. Vaccination is a vital tool that has been used to keep our schools safe for many years. Right now, for children to attend elementary school, they need to be vaccinated against chickenpox, polio, hepatitis B, measles, mumps, rubella, whooping cough, diphtheria, and tetanus. And as they get older, they need also to be vaccinated against meningitis to protect their health. Thankfully, the COVID-19 vaccination is available to those 12 years and older to help reduce the risk of COVID-19 transmission to their loved ones, their neighbors, and their schoolmates. High vaccination rates along with testing and a layered prevention approach that includes masking, frequent hand washing, physical distancing, and staying home when you're sick is important to protecting students and staff from COVID-19. As I've shared in the past, $267 million in federal grant, uh, grant funds uh, are available to assist local educational agencies and non-public schools with implementing COVID-19 screening testing for students and staff in K-12. We are pleased that 758 public school districts and non-public schools have signed up for the screening testing program. This covers 552 public local education agencies, 206 non-public schools, representing a little over 1.4 million students and staff. This large number demonstrates the commitment of schools to keep their students and staff safe. School districts are encouraged to report weekly to the department on student and staff case counts, as well as information on vaccination rates for students and staff. As the governor shared, uh, currently there are 23 total outbreaks linked to in-school transmission in the following counties. Atlantic, four outbreaks. Bergen, one. Cape May, one. Cumberland, two. Gloucester, one. Hudson, two. Mercer, six, Monmouth, one, Morris, one, Sussex, one, and Union, one. The definition of an outbreak is three or more laboratory-confirmed COVID-19 cases among students and, or staff with onsets within a 14-day period who are epidemiologically linked within the school setting, do not share a household, and were not identified as close contacts of each other in another setting. School officials and local health departments should maintain close communications with each other to provide information and share resources on COVID-19 transmission, prevention, and control measures. 
Local education agencies should work closely with the local health as they make decisions regarding which mitigation strategies to implement and when based on the data. As COVID-19 is still circulating in our state, we know strong infection prevention efforts will be vital in reducing transmission of the virus. To support infection prevention and control education uh, among healthcare personnel, the department is awarding 800,000 in funding to the New Jersey Hospital Association, the Healthcare Association of New Jersey, Rutgers Project ECHO, and the New Jersey Association of County and City Health Officials. Using evidence-based protocols, the grantees' work will address immediate infection prevention training needs to a diverse set of healthcare providers in a variety of settings throughout the state. Each grantee is tasked with offering a targeted focus on their organization's area of expertise, servicing long-term care and nursing home professionals, acute care providers, and local health departments. Building a strong foundation for infection prevention at every level of healthcare remains a priority for New Jersey. We are pleased to help support these organizations to ensure that infection prevention basics are taught in a variety of healthcare settings to a wide range of personnel. On to my daily report, the governor shared our hospitals reported 1,152 hospitalizations of COVID-19 persons and persons under investigation. Thankfully, no new reports of multi uh, system inflammatory syndrome in children. Uh, no children are currently hospitalized with MIS. At the state veterans' homes, there's one new positive resident case uh, among residents in the Vineland home. And at the state psychiatric hospitals, no new cases among our patients. The percent positivity as of September 18th for the state, 6.52%. The northern part of the state reports 5.52%. Central, 7.62%, and the southern part of the state, 7.65%. So that concludes my report. Please continue to stay safe, get vaccinated, to protect yourselves, our family, friends, and our children. Thank you. Judy, thank you. Two quickies. The positivity rate, obviously, is higher than we want it to be, but importantly, this is also a day where it's from a weekend, yeah. which was Saturday the 18th, so it's even higher than the... It's been bouncing around 5%. It's up closer to 65 today. Secondly, I mentioned in my remarks, good news is uh, numbers don't feel like they're going up at the rate they were, but the bad news is they've not yet started to come down. But if you just look over the past week at three different numbers to prove that point, total hospitalizations a week ago, 1,155, today 1,152. Uh, ICU beds occupied 275 a week ago today, 267, so a little bit of an improvement. And ventilators a little bit going the, the, the wrong way, 136 a week ago, 144 today, but in a range. Uh, let's hope they start to not just be in a range, but that they start to come off. Thank you, as always, for everything. Pat, good to have you. We got some nasty weather coming. Uh, any more color on potential flooding? I mentioned the counties. You may want to hit that again. Uh, we've got the town hall uh, Friday morning. We had a crazy big fire in a junk heap. Uh, it looks like at Port Newark uh, today. I checked in with a bunch of folks up there. Any, any update you got on that? Over to you, sir. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. Uh, with regards to the weather, the highest risk is going to be tomorrow uh, in the northern part of the state. We're looking at uh, heavy rains, uh, damaging winds, localized flooding, probably starting around noon tomorrow uh, and then around maybe two or three in the afternoon for the southern part of the state. Uh, that will include thunderstorms, and I will echo the seven counties that are currently under a flood watch, Hunterd and Mercer, Middlesex, Morris, Somerset, Sussex, and Warren. Um, the fire, yes, that was a scrapyard fire up there in Port Newark on Calcutta Street. No injuries, which I'm glad to report. It was a one-alarm fire in Newark. OEM has not requested anything from us, but has certainly uh, kept us aware, and we're monitoring that. And on uh, um, an unrelated note, but I think one worth mentioning, was a, a very productive meeting I had this morning with the new director of the ATF who came up from Washington, D.C., Marvin Richardson. Uh, we already have a phenomenal relationship with the ATF and what our crime gun strategies are uh, and out of his mouth he says the rest of the nation looks to New Jersey as the gold star and a model to be replicated with regards to our strategies which are obviously ongoing uh, but I was uh, 
honored to meet with them and comforted to know that we'll be shoulder to shoulder with them moving forward in everything we do to combat uh, illegal guns and gun violence in New Jersey. Thanks, Gov. Pat, thank you. They've been terrific partners from, from day one. Um, that fire, by the way, there was at one point, it, the, given the way the wind was blowing and the, and the fact that they hadn't gotten their arms around it, the visibility uh, potential on the, or lack of visibility on the turnpike was at risk there. But thankfully, it, it, uh, at least as of the, when I walked in here, that, that was not the case. And again, keep, keep tuned to the weather. Um, you know, we're in, this, we're in this spin cycle right now. We know the, the ground has been moistened. It's, there's probably more instability than normal. These things are coming more frequently with more intensity. Um, let's all, you know, we, we don't want to cry wolf here, but make sure you're taking the warning seriously, everybody. So we're going to be in the, in the two a week cadence again next week, unless you hear otherwise. So we're Monday and Wednesday at one o'clock right here. Uh, so we will see you then. We're in a, under a little bit of time pressure today, so let's spin through some questions real quick. Mike, we're going to start with you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. Thank you. I just wanted to return to the uh, notion of a post-mortem on the handling of the pandemic. You said Monday that one reason not to do it now is because we're still in the middle of it. I wanted to follow up and ask, um, you know, isn't it the case that the pandemic is, you know, there's not necessarily going to be a finish line um, so why not give voters a look at what went right and what, what went wrong ahead of the election? And just uh, sort of a detail question, who, who will be conducting that um, for the administration? Is that going to be the health department? Will that be the Office of Disaster Recovery under your office? Um, thanks. That's all I got. Uh, not a lot to add to what you and I talked about on, on Monday. Um, you know, when you have, even though the hospitalizations, as Judy and I were just talking about, 1,152, we know where we, where we were three months ago. Um, that is where we hope to be again. And, and clearly, we've said this countless times, unless my medical colleagues disagree with me, this thing's going to be with us, per perhaps for the rest of our lives. Uh, and I personally think of this as a, as a, f a, a, a flu, bad flu season reality, uh, perhaps at a minimum. But there's clearly going to be a point, I want to be unequivocal about this, that we're going to feel like we can finally say, you know what, we're, we're, not, we're not in hand-to-hand -hand combat as we remain, unfortunately, uh, today. Uh, and, and, and Mike, no decision on who would be, be uh, involved in leading it, but if I had my druthers, it would be a third party. It wouldn't be anybody uh, associated uh, with our team. I think that gives folks the, the best sense that, that somebody was calling balls and strikes. And most importantly, forget about what, uh, you know, the, the most important thing here is to learn from this for all of us to figure out what we need to do better or differently in the future. Thank you. Let's come across to Matt. Matt, how are you? Good afternoon. Uh, does the state plan to release a total number of students and staff who have been tested positive in schools, not just the outbreak totals? Uh, and, you know, do you think it's possible that the increased transparency about uh, students and staff cases, not just the outbreaks, can inform uh, people who have not yet decided to get vaccinated. Uh, on a sec second subject, uh, New Jersey, like much of the nation, has a shortage of school bus drivers. Uh, however, the process here to get a trainee license takes an average of 60 days. Is there anything MVC can do to expedite the testing process and the appointments needed to take them? Any other incentives? And uh, lastly on this, would you consider calling in the National Guard to drive buses like they did in Massachusetts? Yeah. Um I'd defer to Judy and or Angelica uh, on, is it possible to get positive tests um, um, on the dashboard, I assume, is what your, what your perfect world would be. I think the more broader question you asked is, do you think if we were able to do that, it would be a weapon we could use to convince people, uh, more people to get vaccinated? I think any amount of transparency on what's actually happening uh, is a positive toward that objective. So as a general matter, the answer's got to be yes. But Judy or Tina, any, any, any ability to actually you know, get that up and, and accurately on the dashboard? Yes, um, actually, um, we're hoping that those data can be um, publicly available uh, fairly soon. And certainly the utility of having these data about um, 
the trends in um, COVID activity among the students and the staff. It's going to be very helpful not only to um, the, the students and the staff and the schools, but also to the general public to you know have a sense of what is going on because a lot of times the school um, transmission um, information um, outside of outbreak activity also helps to you know kind of reflect what's going on in the community as well. Um, I, I think as it relates to Paramount, you should disagree uh, if you see this differently. I think all options are on the table, including anything we could do with the MVC. Uh, I don't think we at this moment feel like we need to do what Massachusetts did with the National Guard, but that's an option that we certainly um, could, uh, could look at. I was with some educators last night. The, 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 the challenge is real. There's no question about that. I hear from educators. Uh, and Angelica, you must hear it uh, a lot. Uh, from moms and dads, um, and so I'd say anything that we think we can do that 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 preserves safety. I mean, early on in my time as governor, we had a horrific um, accident in with a Paramus uh, school. Not it wasn't in Paramus. I think it was in it was in Morris County. But kids at a middle school in Paramus, and we just got to make sure in our striving to get full capacity, we don't cut any corners in terms of safety. So. Let's go back uh, to Joey. Joey, how are you? Doing good. How are you? I'm well. Uh, so a few things. One, I asked an identical question last week, but wanted to check back in. Any further chance of any more major disaster declarations? There hasn't been word on I, that. I, I don't think the book is shut yet, Pat. Um, is that fair to say that the, it's still technically open, but probably at this point unlikely? Unlikely, I would say, but we still are doing those assessments to see if we hit either public assistance or individual assistance uh, thresholds like we just did in Warren County. So ongoing, but I think the likelihood of additional counties is, is getting less and less as the day yeah, gone. I think more time on the clock lessens the likelihood, but we got Warren a couple of days ago, so that was a, a very good step in the right direction. Cool. Um, you provided some details on which schools had outbreaks. Do you have any details on specifically uh, which schools or school districts had um, schools go virtual? Um, will there be, as you sa now see it, will there be any restrictions on poll workers or voters this November for COVID-related reasons like mask mandates or vaccine mandates for poll workers, anything of that sort? Um, and then finally, this is sort of a grim question, so I apologize, but... Um, a, a what question? A sort of grim question, okay. I apologize. But <laughs> have you or will you, have you done or will you do um, COVID tributes to those who were willfully unvaccinated um, the way that you've been doing for all the victims of COVID? That is grim. Um, data on which districts are virtual, is that your first question? Do we disclose that? Um, at this point, we don't. I think we do this by county, uh, and we'll continue to do that. Um, and that's what we did last school year. I don't think the change is, unless my colleagues correct me in the back, that's the same approach. I don't know that we've laid out the parameters for poll workers, but I'll be very surprised if we're not requiring them to wear masks. Would you agree with that, Councillor? Work with the boards of, edu uh, boards of elections on safety protocols for, uh, for poll workers, uh, but we don't anticipate any restrictions being placed on voters. Uh, on your last question, I, I, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say things that are at odds with each other, but I think they're both um, true. Um, number one, folks need to get vaccinated. There's just no question that that's our best weapon uh, and we got to get over this and get vaccinated. Again, we're among, if not the most vaccinated states in America, certainly among the big states we are. That's great, but we're not yet where we need to be. At the same time, these lives are lost. They, they are gone and they lived lives and uh, I, I don't think vaccine status disclosure is going to be in the cards. Forgetting the HIPAA uh, question where I'm not sure would be even allowed to, um, but these lives are lost, whether we agree with how they approach this or not. It happens, I believe, each of the individuals, unless my memory is failing me, that I spoke to today died early on uh, in, in, in January. I think all three of them did. But that's where I think we'll leave it. Thank you. Uh, Sam, is that you? Yep. Okay, fire away. 
Uh, first couple of following up on Matt's questions here. Uh, would you like to see districts standardize how they present their COVID-19 case data? And is there any directive or EO in the works to do that? And then a uh, separate question, uh, your EO is requiring vaccination or regular testing can hit violators with uh, disorderly persons charges. So who does, sorry? Your uh, executive order is yep. requiring vaccination or testing can hit violators with disorderly persons charges. Um, only one in effect right now is the one applying to healthcare workers, correctional workers, et cetera. But have there been any enforcement actions taken to date to enforce that order? To the best of my knowledge, no, but I, I'm going to defer again to Paramel or Pat. Circle back with you, uh, but you are correct that violation of the executive orders would be a disorderly person's offense. Um, and we'll come back to you if there's any that, uh, that I'm not aware of. In terms of standardizing the data that we get out of districts, and I assume this is anything related to COVID, right? So, yeah, cases, et cetera. Any, any thoughts on either side of me here? Tina, we get, we get, get, make sure we get your money's worth out of this Hi. today. The, the answer is always yes, because, um, you know, anytime that we present our data, whether it's on outbreaks or in our cases, um, they follow um, general criteria for, you know, how we define uh, an outbreak. So, for example, the commissioner went over how we defined um, in-school transmission. Similarly, for um, our data collection from the schools moving forward, particularly as the um, school screening testing program gets on, on board, there's, a, you know, standardized ways that, you know, we are asking school to present that information and it's not just for the school screening it's also for you know that individual um, reporting of the um, students and um, staff data that we're um, in the process of collecting thank you Tina I got this uh, on uh, school buses from Sue Fulton as usual uh, watching us we schedule school bus driver appointments within a day or two all school administrators should have our direct contact information by now School bus driver permits and testing are managed on a concierge basis outside the online appointment system. Hope that helps and we can follow up. Matt, you asked that, right? We can follow up with you and Sue if, if need be. Uh, Alex, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. Dr. Tan, can you tell us how many children under five have contracted COVID-19 since the pandemic began, if you have those numbers? Several months ago, Commissioner Persicelli said that children were not the vectors of the virus that you expected. Is she correct? And if so, why the masking order for children in daycare over the age of two? Commissioner, we uh, heard the governor talk about some trends uh, that are going in a positive direction. Can you elaborate a little bit? Can you explain how a difference of eight people on ventilators or not on ventilators is significant or is it not? And we hear about these magic moments where the pall will be lifted and we'll be free of the virus. We've been waiting for that since May of last year. Will that ever happen? Governor, on the questions on a post-mortem, in your words, of looking into the origins of COVID-19, where is the progress of the Attorney General's review into the nursing homes that you ordered last year under then Attorney General Graywall? And will you commit to releasing the results of that review before Election Day? I'd also like to ask you what you think about the criticism of your masking order for children in daycare. Do you think parents are overreacting? Is it more of an argument about unworkability or is it an ineffectiveness argument that you think uh, rings true for, for you if the numbers of children that have contracted COVID-19 are relatively low? And for Dr. Alan McMillan, for my colleague Walt Kane, Sorry, I have to read this off the phone. I don't memorize it. Statistics show continued inequalities in New Jersey's education system. For example, black students are more than five times more likely to be suspended than white students, and black and Latino students are underrepresented in AP classes. What is the New Jersey Department of Education doing to make the system more equal? Let me start uh, on a bunch of these. And Tina, I'm going to ask you to weigh in here, uh, and perhaps um, Judy as well. I'm going to skip to the trend question first. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, just because ventilators are down, uh, or, or, or ventilators are up a couple, and ICU beds are down a couple, I do not. I, I think the trend is right now, as we've said, we're, we're sort of in a range bumping along. That would be my guess. I don't think there's any break I don't want to use the word breakthrough, in a, but in this case, that there's no breakthrough um, yet. Although that's, it's encouraging. As I say, good news, bad news, good news is it's not going down. Um, I've been waiting for the same t 
time, you're, you're, you're waiting for it. We all want that. We actually thought, I think, as a nation, probably as a world, but as a nation that we were there around in that window between Memorial Day and July 4th. And I believe that we'll get back to that. Uh, we were talking about this a couple of minutes ago, uh, but we're, we're not there yet. We're still in the fight. And uh, again, this thing is humbling. Uh, anybody who's associated with this, every time you think you got it figured out, it takes a turn and eight out of 10 of them are negative. Um, nothing new to report unless Paramel does on the AG's report on long-term care, and I'd be shocked if it weren't made public, and I have no idea on the timing. I've got no insight into that. Would you agree with that? That's correct, Governor. The Attorney General's investigation uh, into long-term care facilities is an independent investigation. We, yeah, don't we have, have, no, we have nothing, no, no insight on that one. Um, you've got a bunch here that were not in the exact order, but they sort of come back to the same thing. What's the, the, the cumulative total of infections or positive tests for kids under five? Are, can, can kids get sick? Can they infect others? And how do we feel about the, the masking of daycare, particularly for young kids? i just repeat on, on, on daycare, and then I'll turn it to, to Judy and Tina to, to fill in here. We're, we're doing nothing different than the CDC guidance and all of our neighbors, we're all doing the same thing. Uh, now, does that make it mean it's easy that someone else has found a magic weapon to be able to get a two-year-old to keep a mask on? No, we, we recognize that the daycare providers and staff, you know, are, 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 have to work uniquely with that challenge, and we can totally appreciate that. But we're doing just, at this point, what the CDC recommends, what our neighbors, neighboring states are doing as well. Um, Anything you want to add to, uh, I'm not sure we know cumulative cases sitting here for folks under five. Do we have that, Tina? And well, any other comments on kids getting infected or infecting others? Yeah, um, you know, I, I have the data from Monday, but, um, you know, it's basically about uh, a little bit over 2% um, of our cases overall um, occur among those who are aged as zero to four years of age. The specific number I don't want to give only because, you know, I know that they're updated, you know, every single day, and we can, we can certainly get back to you on that. Um, you know, as far as, um, you know, the, the risk to um, individuals in the community and, and children, anybody um, who is um, unvaccinated, you know, always potentially poses a risk of transmission of um, SARS-CoV-2 to um, the entire community. And, you know, that's why, you know, we always are encouraging individuals to, uh, who are unvaccinated to continue to wear masks and to also um, take the appropriate precautions to try to minimize um, spread, inadvertent spread, uh, in particular to um, others um, uh, in the community, particularly those, um, you know, who might be more vulnerable to serious illness. Tina, thank you. Judy, anything you want to add? I think we have to you know, keep in mind that we monitor uh, multi-inflammatory syndrome in children. Every single one of those children have had COVID, and we had 133 cases, uh, with a majority of them in the hospital at some point in time. And we have had seven deaths of uh, individuals 18 years and younger uh, from COVID uh, in, the, in the state. Um, so that's something we look at every day. Uh, any death, um, as the governor said repeatedly, is awful, but it's certainly uh, more alarming when it's a child. Amen to all. Angelica, I'll just make the observation that um, there continues to be, we've said this many times, uh, I say it almost every, every single day, that the pandemic did not create the inequities in our state, but it's laid them bare, and among the inequities are in education. Uh, it's the animating reason why we plow the resources that we do into underserved communities and, and continue to try to move that needle in the right uh, direction. Uh, you know, we're digging out of, uh, depending on what you blame, and it's probably a combination of things. In the criminal justice system, at least, it's the war on drugs over the past several decades. It's early years of the fifth century since slavery came to our shores in North America. Um, but it, there's no question the inequities exist, and there's also no question that we throw an enormous amount of resources, financial and otherwise, at trying to shrink those inequities as much and as fast as we can. Angelica, anything you want to add, please? Uh, thank you, Governor. I'd like to also add our work on creating clearing houses that allow school districts to learn from one another. It is critical in this 
public health emergency era that we're living in, that districts are able to share, to partner, and to join together to address some of the inequities that you have mentioned. So we stand with districts in moving forward, and we believe that these tranches of funding from the federal government, along with the increases provided by Governor Murphy over the years, will continue to help us make inroads. Thank you for that. Sir, you're up to bat. Good afternoon, Governor. I, th I thought you were going to say that you didn't have any today. No, unfortunately, I don't get the 20. Okay. Uh, from Brenda Flanagan, uh, the child care industry is facing backlash over your mask and vaccine mandate while also experiencing staffing shortages. Meanwhile, New Jersey has yet to distribute roughly $700 million in federal American Rescue Plan funds intended to help their companies. When will that money be made available? And a question from Leah Mishkin. Passaic County is considering closing its jail and potentially consolidating with Bergen County. What do you think are the pros and cons of county jails merging? Thank you. Thanks. Um, listen, I think on the first one, we've kind of addressed this, that we get it. We know it's not, it brings us no joy. I want to make sure I say that with great emphasis to be mandating masks, particularly on little kids. I mean, that's not something that we're doing happily, but we are doing it consistent with the CDC with our neighbors, and we're doing it based on the, on the facts. And by the way, we're doing it not forever, please God. Uh, in terms of distribution of, of resources, we're getting as money on the street. We put a ton on the street already, and we're getting it on the street as fast as we can. So there, there, there's no uh, holding back, assuming we can, we can do that, and we continue to do that. And my guess is folks should expect more um, of that and not less. Um, I haven't been asked the question before about consolidation. I mean, you want to make sure you do something like that the right way, uh, that you do it with respect to the folks who are uh, incarcerated in those uh, facilities, as well as to the staff and members of law enforcement and corrections officers who serve them and, and protect those facilities. Um, so I don't have any visceral yay or nay, um, but uh, if, if there is a good positive reason to do it and it can be done safely and smartly from a budget standpoint and is not taken out on the backs of public sector employees which too often happens when you have mergers then that may be a good thing to pursue but i don't have any specifics on the details thank you dave you're bringing us home thank you governor first for commissioner alan mcmillan um you mentioned emergency relief funds can be applied for next week, and you pointed out uh, this includes the mental health for students and uh, educators as well. Um, could you give us a little insight? Uh, what does that mean? Is it going to be one-on-one -on -one therapy? Would it be group therapy? Would it take place in school, after school, on weekends? Do, would, would the students go somewhere for this? Would they bring them into the schools and so forth? Um, you a couple of times mentioned the diff uh, if a school has to be remote or virtual. What's the difference? Um, you also mentioned, I think when the question came up initially, that you do not disclose which districts are now all virtual because of COVID. Could you explain why not? Why you don't give this information? And. Um, I'm sorry, uh, with regard to the emergency funding, besides the mental health assistance that is being, uh, will be made available, could you explain just in simple terms what else, what other kinds of services schools will be able to offer and how they'll be able to use this money for what specific kinds of things? Uh, Governor, there are literally no MVC appointments for teen drivers right now to get their licenses. This is causing hysteria in the teen community, I understand. <clears throat> Your reaction, and <clears throat> not to belabor the point, but if a parent, for instance, or a daycare worker goes in and sees a kid not wearing a mask, or they put the mask on the two-year-old, the kid is running around, rips off the mask immediately, um, is there gonna be a warning given? Will there be a penalty? I mean, I understand you're not, this is not a gotcha kind of a thing that yep. you're trying to do here. I think you've explained why you're trying to make sure this is incorporated. Yep. But, you know, is there going to be any teeth to the EO? 
Will there be any kind of follow-up at all? How can this be enforced? And what would you say to a, a parent or a, a daycare instructor who gets a kid and the kid just won't wear the mask and, and runs like a wild monkey? Because I don't think that's going to be, I mean, some kids are obedient and follow the rules when they're two. Yep. And as you and I were talking about on Monday, some don't and some 20-year-olds don't. C correct. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to be brief. I'm the last one. I've literally got nothing more to add on this. I mean, we, 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 we know that this is not easy. We know these kids are two in some cases. Uh, these providers are overwhelmingly trying to do the right thing. Uh, is there teeth? Yes. If there's willful ig ignoring of the uh, protocols, yeah, 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 there, there has to be some consequence, but, but probably not for the two-year-old. We just want to make sure the environment there is the right environment that gets to the point that we're trying to get to, which is we keep, as, we keep folks as safe as possible and keep them as healthy as possible. I, I knew if I answered that first that Sue Fulton from the Motor Vehicles Commission, I want to thank her publicly, would, have, would come to me while I was answering that. So Sue says the following. We are always, this is for the, the, the historical uh, teen question you asked. We are always adding appointments, though we are currently in a crunch for first permit appointments and knowledge tests. Uh, we are piloting a new program of off-site testing on Saturday in Wanakue in partnership with the Passaic Community College and using one of our mobile units for support. If successful, we will be able to add hundreds of test appointments over the next months. Uh, and we may want to follow up. Aliana Post is running the show today with Dave and, and Sue. And, and then um, the rest of the questions, Angelica, are largely in your, cat, in, in your uh, bailiwick. I would just say this, that for now many months, I'm proud of the fact that really unlike any other state, we had been directing uh, federal resources toward uh, mental health uh, challenges, toward learning loss challenges. So this is not a new impulse, it's a continuation of what we've been doing. But Angelica, you, you heard the questions. Any, any color you want to add? Yes, thank you, Governor. So first and foremost, the three tranches of funding from the federal government, starting with CARES, then CARISA, and now the ART funding, allow school districts to have flexibilities within 15 broad categories. And what is uh, great for the school districts is that they are able to target the funds to meet their needs. And so 90% of each tranche is directed to the school district based on a formula established by the federal government. Where we have flexibility is with the set aside, the remaining 10% the remaining of the uh, allocation. And so what we have done is listen to what is needed. And we decided that it was best to follow the research and let the science help us structure supports for school districts to address learning acceleration. We've heard a lot about learning loss, but our approach is to provide remedies to help with solutions. So learning acceleration, which focuses on instruction throughout the traditional school day, as well as opportunities to have learning take place outside of that, which is learning which will be considered after school, before school care, and any other type of creative uh, entity or out growth of that that a school district may want to embrace. And then we have summer enrichment. There are opportunities that districts have seen successfully and we're collecting data to understand how they leverage these funds to enrich those opportunities for students. And finally, with the mental health supports. And you asked at the beginning of your questions, how are we ensuring that your we litany are, of questions? Yes. <laughs> how are we assure, ensuring that we are helping with the mental health of our students and staff? So in the first two tranches of funding, we had more of a holistic approach where we wanted to focus on universal supports that goes to everyone. But when you look at our New Jersey tiered system of supports, there are three levels. And so we start with universal for everyone. And that would be simply, say, implementing a meditation program in a school where everyone can benefit. And then you move to a targeted support system, which is a, often referred to as Tier 2. And in that system, we take small groups of students who may need uh, similar supports. And then the third is what we call the intensive uh, system, where we support students who may have individual needs. Suicidal ideation may be an example. So in this latest tranche of funding, the ARP-ESSER, we focus primarily on Tier 2 and Tier 3. 
knowing that school districts may need the additional targeted funds to help those most in need. So that is the framework within which we operate to ensure that we are giving districts the greatest level of flexibility with the supports that we are able to walk with them hand in hand as we continue through 2024 with the expending of these funds. We got a shutdown, but you had one other question in there. Are you making a distinct, distinction between remote and virtual? Yes. So with virtual, that refers to the digital platforms that are available, and remote encompasses everything else, which refers to if we had an uh, instance where a student was unable to access a device, we would have paper and pencil. Thank you. Thank you for all that. Um, I want to thank uh, Judy, Tina, Angelica. Great to have you back. Pat, Aliana, Paramel, the whole team. Um, thank you all. We'll be with you again Monday at 1 o'clock unless you hear otherwise. Um, thank you, everybody, for overwhelmingly doing the right thing. Uh, but I am going to leave you repeating a quote from Jim Franklin, who's lost his dad, John, who was a giant in Lakewood. And folks, make sure you hear this. People who refuse to get vaccinated have never seen a family member die on FaceTime. It's awful. Thank you all. God bless.